Welcome, everybody. I'm Andrew Goodman from the Multiple Sclerosis Program at the University of Rochester in New York. I'll be speaking about improving the management of walking impairment and foot drop in multiple sclerosis. So first, we'll talk about gait, how to assess it clinically, uh, and how it's assessed in, in uh, clinical research. And then we'll be speaking in the next section about non-pharmacologic management of gait disorders associated with multiple sclerosis. So in the next slide, you can see the commonest symptoms of MS listed roughly in uh, order of, of, of prevalence. Uh, and among them, on the highest uh, part of the list of prevalence is uh, gait difficulty. Putting this into context, as you know, there has been tremendous progress in the past 20 years in the development of uh, what I would consider anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory treatments for multiple sclerosis, trying to treat the disease process that causes the damage. But of course, once the damage is done to the central nervous system of patients with MS, um, those treatments are not uh, uh, able to uh, repair that damage. So we are left with literally hundreds of thousands of patients who have permanent central nervous system injury, and as a consequence, have symptoms such as those listed in this slide. So what we're talking about in, in this discussion is how we manage those symptoms consequent to the damage in the central nervous system in the context of trying, of course, to prevent further damage with immunotherapy. In the next slide, the prevalence of gait impairment in MS. Uh, we see uh, the results of a, a study done several years ago commissioned by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society in about a 1,000 people with MS. And in that study, there were 64% of people who indicated that they experienced trouble walking at least twice weekly. And of those 64%, 70% thought that it was the most challenging aspect of their MS. Now, as we move to the next slide, we see that uh, despite people understanding that they have uh, these gait-related problems, in the context of discussion with, with their physician and other health care providers, uh, it does not come up in the majority of visits. 39% of people surveyed said that they never discuss mobility issues with their physician. So this seems to indicate that there is still a need for neurologists and other MS professional care providers to initiate conversations about mobility. Moving on to the next slide. So what is the impact of gait impairment on people with MS? Well, the impact is on their quality of life. And studies such as the one cited here clearly indicate that people experience a loss of independence. Of course, there's uh, potential social embarrassment because of the physical appearance of disability and the stigma that is still associated with that sort of association. And um, no question that this has an impact on employability as people lose their, uh, their independent mobility. So the next slide is, is a, uh, a graphic of what is known as the EDSS or the Kurtzky scale, which has been used for, for three decades and more now in the MS uh, research community. Uh, particularly for describing the impact of MS on individual patients, and, and it has been uh, adapted into use in clinical trials as well, even though that was not uh, its original purpose. That said, the key uh, point for today's discussion is the prominence that Dr. Kurtzke noted in the symptomatology resulting from MS that walking disturbance or gait impairment has. So as we look from from the EDSS level of four all the way through seven and a half, so a big portion of, of his observations of, of uh, the impact of, of MS on people's day-to-day -day functioning uh, embedded in, in his scale is a very prominent place for walking impairment. So moving to the next slide, we see the definition of ambulation, which is um, more ample than just gait or walking impairment. So to put it in context, on a fundamental level, the goal of ambulation is for an individual to move from point A to point B and, of course, to do it as safely as possible. 
So in this ample definition, ambulation not only encompasses typical bipedal walking or gait, but also includes locomotion via other means such as with a manual or power wheelchair. But today, we will be really restricting our comments to gait and gait impairment. And so what are the basic prerequisite functional requirements for anybody to have a normal gait? So firstly, there has to be sufficient anti-gravity strength in order for each foot to clear the floor or ground during the swing phase for each step. And secondly, this has to occur in the setting of sufficient strength and joint stability across the ankle, knee, and hip joints in order to support the body's weight. Next slide, uh, we see common methods used to measure gait impairment. So firstly is what we all do as clinicians, and that is assess a, a casual or normal gait. And we look for, of course, ataxia. We look for spasticity. We look for weakness, such as most commonly seen in, in, in foot drop, which we will be discussing in detail in the coming slides. We also, in in practice, but more often in in, in clinical research, use a variety of, of validated uh, tools or instruments uh, to more um, uh, uh, quantitatively assess gait. Uh, among them is the time 25-foot walk, which is a standard part of the uh, MS functional composite scoring system that was developed for clinical research. Uh, we already alluded to the EDSS, which includes, uh, because of its importance, as I illustrated, a distance walk of up to 500 meters. Uh, and finally, we mentioned a, a patient-reported outcome, uh, the 12-item MSWS-12, uh, which asks the patient 12 questions related to how MS is impacting on, on their walking or gait. Among them are such questions are, is MS impacting on how far you can walk, how fast you can walk, how well you walk up and down stairs, how long you can stand, and, and similar questions. So moving to the next slide, what are the commonest gait abnormalities seen in people with multiple sclerosis? So foot slap due to mild dorsiflexion weakness at the ankle, also known as foot drop, um, is undoubtedly the commonest. We also see people with knee instability because of uh, weakness around the knee with buckling uh, or back knee, in quotes, um, type uh, abnormalities, which can lead to injury of the knee and certainly can lead to instability and falling. Trendelenburg sign, secondary to uh, hip abduction weakness, can also be seen. Um, and in this scenario, the Trendelenburg sign is when the contralateral side drops because the ipsilateral hip abductors are not sufficiently strong to stabilize the pelvis to prevent the, the drop on the other side. We can also see the steppage gait pattern, which is associated with more severe weakness of ankle dorsiflexion. Again, focusing on, on foot drop in MS, uh, the so-called foot drop or foot slap pattern in, in relatively milder ankle dorsiflexion weakness is characterized um, by an initial ground contact, usually with the heel of the foot, and then a loud sound, which some people call a slapping sound, uh, that can be heard as the rest of the foot then strikes the floor. And this is an, in, in, in distinction to the more uh, severe ankle dorsiflexion weakness associated with the steppage gait pattern in which the knee raises as if in a kind of marching pattern and the initial contact of the foot will be quiet with the front as the, as the foot touches in front rather than in the back and as, as in the foot slab pattern. And this is, uh, again, a fairly common pattern, although not quite um, as frequently seen as the milder ankle dorsiflexion weakness associated with foot slap. So even patients who apparently have full strength in their ankle dorsiflexion on manual motor testing may in fact exhibit a foot slap pattern after walking some distance uh, or walking quickly. So in practice, uh, we may uh, see this as patients walk in from, uh, from the parking garage or parking lot and tire out if we catch that when they're still tired because this is a better 
way of capturing what they experience in real life, and another way of, of bringing out a subtle weakness in ankle dorsiflexion and a foot drop is by actually having patients do a, a rapid walk as is done in the time 25 foot walk. Why is this important? It's important because detection of this type of weakness um, with insufficient foot, foot clearance is one of the things that puts people at risk for, for falling and of course uh, further injury. So again, a very important thing to ask about and to look for. So what are important principles of, of managing uh, gait difficulties in people with MS? From my perspective, I think one of the most important overarching principles is that it needs to be multidisciplinary. That is, the neurologist or neurology-based care provider uh, ought to um, enlist the, uh, the help and advice of, of other professionals, including physiatrists, physical therapists, and occupational therapists. And together, uh, we can recommend appropriate exercises, including very important range of motion and stretching exercises, particularly when spasticity, which often accompanies the weakness associated with MS, um, is, is at play. Uh, and, and then, of course, the uh, judicious use of assistive devices. And then finally, we can blend in carefully individualized pharmacotherapy. The next slide provides a list of commonly used assistive devices for people with impaired ambulation. In my view, these ought to be prescribed in conjunction or in consultation with physical therapists or physiatrists. And the list, as you can see, includes uh, single-point canes, quad canes, forearm crutches, also known as Canadian crutches, four-point folding walkers, front-wheeled walkers, four-wheeled walkers with seat and active braking systems, four-wheeled walkers with seat and passive braking systems. Importantly for people with foot drop are the ankle foot orthoses. Various types include posterior leaf spring, double metal upright, ground reaction force, and the lighter weight carbon fiber type. Next slide indicates that in recent years, functional electrical stimulation devices have emerged into the marketplace. To my knowledge, none of these have been specifically FDA approved, but they are commercially available. And these include the NES L300, the WalkAid, and the OddStick drop foot stimulator. And these are geared towards assisting people with foot drop by directly stimulating the common fibular nerve and causing a muscle contraction uh, that is uh, timed with each step. Now, the next slide indicates that there are some contraindications to using such uh, electrical stimulation devices, including avoiding people uh, with uh, particular types of pacemakers that um, may uh, be sensitive to this type of interference from electrical stimulation. Uh, people with uncontrolled epilepsy, people with skin breakdown in the area of electrical stimulation, and also people who may have peripheral nerve injury in the area of stimulation. So the next slide gives an overview of, of fall prevention strategies. Um, and this, again, is often done in conjunction and consultation with occupational therapists, including those who may be able to do a home assessment because changing the, the patient's environment for safety reasons is, is sort of the critical step here. And this may mean installing heavy-duty grab bars in showers and tubs and in the bathroom uh, beside toilets, um, rearranging the furniture and, uh, and the layout of, of homes to avoid the so-called obstacle course uh, situation that can occur uh, unless this is thought about. And finally, uh, maintaining clear pathways not only inside the house, but in the approach to the house and the outside, going from the garage into the house and so on, all quite important in, in managing the environment for safety uh, in the context of fall prevention. And then, of course, the various assistive devices that we've just outlined uh, are also critical. And as a final thought on this, um, I often uh, advise patients to think before they go. As we uh, learn to walk as children, uh, learn that walking becomes a kind of automatic uh, function, 
but in people with MS who have balance issues and and foot drop issues and spasticity issues that impact on their gait, in order to avoid falling, it's important for them to think and plan before they go, and I always remind my patients about this strategy. So now let's move to the next section of, of our discussion, and this is about pharmacologic management of walking difficulties in MS. The first part will be about dalfampronine extended release. So what's the historic rationale for what we now call dalfampronine extended release in MS? Dalfampronine extended release is the generic name for the chemical 4-aminopyridine. 4-aminopyridine, also known as 4-AP, has been considered as a possible treatment for MS for a number of years. Historically, the rationale is based on the following observations. 4-AP is a broad-spectrum central nervous system potassium channel blocker. In animal studies, it was shown to restore conduction of action potentials in focally demyelinated axons through inhibition of potassium channels. It has been considered, therefore, a promising candidate to reverse under, underlying neurological deficits associated with MS demyelination, as I spoke to at the beginning of the talk, and hopefully to be able to restore neurologic function, at least partially, in these patients. For aminopyridine or for AP, um, has had a number of names in the course of its development and since its approval by the FDA. In a number of published studies in the clinical development of 4-AP for MS, it was called Fampardine or Fampardine SR or sustained release. But upon approval by the FDA as a treatment to improve walking in patients with MS, the name was changed to Dalfampardine ER or Dalfampardine extended release. 4-AP has been used, as I've said, for decades in clinical research based on the rationale we just discussed. In 1992, a group from the Netherlands published a study using 4-AP in an immediate release formulation in MS, and they found broad effects on disability, including EDSS, but drawbacks to the immediate release formulation with difficulty in controlling plasma levels. And this first hinted at the need for developing an extended release formulation. In 1994, Bever and colleagues from the University of Maryland published a concentration-controlled study in which they observed improvements in contrast sensitivity in vision, limb strength, and other aspects of the neurologic exam. However, they noticed seizures and confusional episodes at higher serum levels, again suggesting a concern about using the immediate release formulation as they did in this study. So moving to the next slide, uh, based on those observations and others, uh, there was a clear rationale for developing a sustained release or what became known as an extended release formulation. As we've said, immediate release formulations have limitations, including a rapid rise in pl plasma levels, which can be associated with typical adverse effects, such as dizziness, nausea, and paresthesias, and, as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, seizure. Uh, other limitations of the immediate release formulations are short half-life, requiring more frequent dosing, and a substantial effect of food on the pharmacokinetics and, therefore, for on the plasma levels of the drug. To try and uh, avoid further confusion as we move uh, through the slides, um, I should point out that for purposes of our discussion, extended release, which was the term used uh, at the time of FDA approval, and sustained release, which was the term that was used in various studies that led to publications, are equivalent. The first Phase three study, or Phase 3A study, of what became known as Dalfampardine Extended Release was published in The Lancet in 2009. This was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of what has become called Dalfampardine Extended Release. You can see in the next slide the study design, which included a placebo run-in of two weeks, 
followed by 14 weeks of double-blind placebo-controlled assessments, of which there were four, followed um, after 14 weeks by follow-up assessments. In the phase three trials of dalfampridine, as you can see on the next slide, we came to use a responder analysis approach to analyzing um, the efficacy outcomes. Typically, in clinical trials of immunotherapies for multiple sclerosis that we've become accustomed to, group mean differences have been compared. But in the responder analysis approach, which we used in the phase three trials of the alfampernine, we compared the proportion or percentage of patients in each group who met a strictly and prospectively defined criterion for responder. Moving to the next slide, in the dalfampridine phase three studies, the responder analysis, of course, looked at the proportion or percentage of patients in each group who met the predefined criterion for responsiveness. Just to reiterate, we did not set out as a primary endpoint to look at mean differences between groups. The studies were not designed in that fashion. But what the responder analysis does is give us a method for capturing the high variability of responsiveness that we see in people with MS. That is, when some individuals have a high level of response while others show little or no response, which is, in fact, the reality we've observed with alfampridine and other treatments for MS. So the variability that, that is seen in people with MS is both within patient over time and from patient to patient, or so-called interpatient variability. Some patients respond briefly or not at all. Other patients respond very well. And the responder analysis is, a, is an established method for, for trying to deal with this sort of variability. It allows us to assess people on an individual basis. And this is, of course, consistent and useful with how we manage people individually in practice. And it also facilitates a, a correlation with um, patient reported or patient perceived value of their response to treatment. So moving to the phase 3A study, we again use the primary outcome measure of proportion of patients who met the criterion for being a responder. And when we say responder, we're referring to their response to dalfampridine or placebo in in the use of the timed 25-foot walk. So we define the timed 25-foot walk responder as any subject whose walking speed was faster on at least three of the four on-drug study visits during the 14-week period in the Phase 3A study. And this was in comparison to the five off-drug visits before and after that phase of the study. The results of the primary outcome assessment are seen in the next slide graphically, where in the intent to treat population, there was approximately 35% proportion of people who met the response criterion taking dalfampridine extended release compared to 8.3% in the placebo group. This was a highly statistically significant difference. In the next slide, we looked at patient-reported outcomes, not what we were measuring as, as investigators, what, but what the patients felt. And I previously mentioned the MSWS-12 and what it entailed, and the patients were, were given this survey. And what we found was strong confirmation of the relationship between people meeting the response criterion and improvement on the MSWS-12, again, a highly significant result indicating and validating that the response criterion was associated with what patients actually felt themselves in relation to their walking ability. So to summarize, on the next slide, the dalfampridine extended release first phase three trial or phase 3A trial. It was a 14-week study with approximately 300 patients 
Among them were people with all different disease course patterns, relapsing, secondary progressive, primary progressive, progressive relapsing. The proportion of people who met the predetermined time walk response criterion based on the 25-foot walk test uh, was 35% versus 8%, a highly statistically significant difference. On average, among those who were dalfampardine time walk responders, the improvement from baseline was approximately 25% versus slightly less than 5% for the placebo group. So this is another way of demonstrating the um, magnitude of the effect. And we'll talk further uh, in our discussion about the implication of a 25% improvement from baseline. Importantly, the MSWS-12, a patient-reported outcome, showed that those who, who met the criterion for time walk responsiveness also had a significantly greater improvement in their subjective um, experience of walking uh, on study. Interestingly, manual motor testing of leg strength also showed that both time walk responders and those on active treatment with dalfampronine uh, who did not meet the criterion for walking response both showed statistically significant um, improvement in, in motor strength in their legs compared to the placebo group. Importantly, we also observed consistent improvement over the course of the 14 weeks on study drug. So that is that the difference in magnitude of change in walking from baseline was sustained to about the level of 25% over the 14-week study period and then diminished, of course, when people were withdrawn from the drug. What were the most frequent adverse events observed in the Phase 3A study? The most frequently reported uh, events were, as you can see, falls, urinary tract infections, dizziness, and insomnia. Fatigue, nausea, stenia, back pain, balance disorders, and headaches were also reported. And there were clearly more serious adverse events seen on fampronine than placebo. Let's move to the next section, which will describe the second phase three study of dalfampadine, extended release. And this study was published in the Annals of Neurology in 2010, and it was called a phase three trial of extended release oral dalfampadine in multiple sclerosis. Moving to the next slide, we see the study design for the second phase three study, also known as phase three B study which was very similar in pattern to the previous study, although in this study the duration of on-drug visits in the placebo-controlled uh, assessment phase was shorter. It was nine weeks. Otherwise, similar design, and the same response criterion was used as defined as three of the four on-drug visits being faster than any of the five off-drug visits. On the next slide, we see some of the results. Again, this was a nine-week study with 237 patients with a placebo control in approximately half of them. The proportion of time walk responders was seen to be 43% approximately versus 9%. Again, a highly statistically significant difference. We'll see this in the graphic in the next slide. Here again, the change from baseline in those who met the criterion for dalfampronine time walk response was approximately 25% versus approximately 8% for the placebo group. Again, the patient-reported outcome, MSWS12, had significantly, significantly greater improvement in the time walk responders than those who did not. And yet again, the leg strength testing was significantly greater in the time walk responders than in the placebo group. As I said, the graphic uh, on the next slide demonstrates uh, a very similar pattern to what we saw in the previous uh, trial. Likewise, on the next slide, we see very similar pattern of improvement in the patient-reported outcome, MSWS12, comparing directly here the Phase 3A study on the left to the Phase 3B study on the right. Moving to, to the next slide, this is a graphic demonstration of what I previously mentioned from the first 
study, phase 3A. Again, we see in the phase 3B study approximately 25% average improvement in those people who met the consistency response criterion. And it's sustained over the course, in this case, of nine weeks, but in the previous study, it was a 14-week sustained response of a similar pattern. So based on the data which we've just reviewed from the Phase 3A and 3B studies and the entire safety assessments over the years with 4-aminopyridine, the FDA approved dalfamperidine extended release to improve walking in adult patients with multiple sclerosis because in clinical trials, they said patients treated with dalfamperidine extended release had faster walking speeds than those treated with an inactive placebo. This is the first drug that the FDA approved for such a purpose. So moving to the next section of our discussion, what has been the post-marketing uh, experience and additional studies looking at patient outcomes? So the first was published by Hobart and others in neurology uh, in 2013. And this looked at pool data from both of the phase three studies we just discussed in detail. And in particular, it focused on trying to better understand the clinical meaningfulness of improvement on the 25-foot walk. Outcomes that were looked at were the 25-foot walk, speed variability, both within and between visits. Importantly, correlations between the 25-foot walk and the MSWS-12 when they were measured concurrently were looked at, and changes in the MSWS-12 that were associated with changes in the 25-foot walk uh, were, were assessed statistically. And importantly, what was found was that the variability in the 25-foot walk speed testing was generally fairly small, both within and between visits, uh, that correlations between the 25-foot walk speed and the MSWS-12 values were relatively small but improved in strength. Uh, when they were changing between visits. Importantly, speed improvements of greater than 20% in, in walking as assessed by the time, time 25 foot walk and possibly as little as 15% were associated with clinically meaningful changes in self-reported walking ability uh, using the MSWS-12. Moving to the next slide, uh, reported by Kruger and others also in 2013 was a study looking at the long-term clinical benefit of dalfamperidine in, in what they called the real-world setting. In this study, they assessed changes in walking speed using dalfamperidine sustained release or in Europe uh, prolonged release um, at four weeks, three months, and six months. Again, the time 25-foot walk was used as an assessment and the MSWS-12. What was found in the study was a considerable improvement in walking speed at four weeks of greater than 10% in half the patients and greater than 20% in 36.8% of the patients. Approximately two-thirds of the patients subjectively showed an improvement uh, at four weeks in the MSWS-12. By six months, uh, it, there does appear to be uh, a decrement in um, in those people showing objective changes in walking and to some degree in their subjective experience, which might be, of course, expected over time as a majority of the people in this study were um, at entry known to be patients with progressive MS, so therefore their baseline uh, is likely worsening over time. Another study reported by Cameron and others in multiple sclerosis in 2013, looked at a cohort of patients in the Veterans Administration MS clinics longitudinally. They looked at 
change from baseline to initial follow-up at six to eight weeks, and then longitudinally at one year, again using the time 25-foot walk, the MSWS-12, a two-minute walk looking at how far they could go, and a community integration questionnaire. And what they found was that first follow-up after six to eight weeks, that there were significant improvements in all of these measures. At one year, the distance walk and the subjective testing were still significant, with the same caveats about deterioration that may happen in baseline over even one year in such patients. There have been post hoc analyses reported at various meetings listed in the references at the bottom of the slide indicating in the phase three clinical trials, which we previously reviewed, that the response to dalfampronine was independent of all baseline characteristics that we looked at, including immunomodulator therapy, meaning whether they were taking interferon or glitirumer or natalizumab and so on, all failed to show any differences in terms of their ability to respond to dalfampronine. Likewise, responsiveness was seen over a broad spectrum of baseline deficits and whether or not patients were called relapsing, progressive, or any combination of those patterns. Another report seen in the next slide that was presented at the Academy of Neurology meetings a couple of years ago indicated that the concomitant use of walking aids plus dalfampronine ex extended release improved walking speed in the phase three trial. And this is certainly consistent with my clinical experience that suggests that there is indeed a synergy between not only walking devices and the pharmacotherapy with dalfampronine, but also physical therapy and exercise therapy. So where do I see things going in the future? So the next slide indicates that um, I am hopeful that with research we may better understand the responsiveness or lack of responsiveness as we've seen in a majority of patients in these studies uh, so that we might be able to improve upon this or at least be able to better predict who is likely to respond and who not based on, on perhaps improved insights about the potassium channel distribution and abnormalities that occur in people with demyelinated axons such as MS. I'm also hopeful that the type of clinical trial methodology, and in particular the responder analysis of walking speed, may be useful as we move into novel, restorative, or regenerative experimental approaches. Among them are studies that are already beginning with an anti-lingo antibody approach to try and stimulate myelin growth, or even cell-based therapies such as stem cell uh, infusions or transplantation. Now, what about applying these data in practice? What has been my experience? What I will typically do is offer a trial of a prescription of 10 milligrams dalfampridine extended release tablets given twice daily for approximately two to four weeks. Clearly, people with a history of seizure or renal insufficiency, as indicated on the slide, need to be excluded. My clinical evaluation of response uh, typically uses the time 25-foot walk, but not exclusively. It's critically important to listen to the patients and what their experience has been. And we talk about the quality of their gait, how fatigable it is, how well they do in stair climbing, how they well they do with distance walking and balance, and so on. We also have to take into account whatever adverse experience they assess. Typically, these may be insomnia, nausea, additional tingling or paresthesias. And based on this, we make a assessment as we do with, with other symptomatic therapies as to whether or not there is a favorable benefit to risk. That is, are the side effects too troubling? or does the benefit outweigh whatever side effects they're experiencing? I find, again, the 25-foot walk to be a useful measure, and I objectively use this in, partic in particular if there's a greater than 20% improvement, as we've discussed and has been demonstrated in recent publications. Um, this is likely going to be associated with a clinically meaningful benefit, which patients will report. In conclusion, as we said from the outset, gait problems are quite common in MS but are not adequately addressed or frequently addressed in clinical encounters in practice. Ideally, 
an optimal individualized approach will include assessments by physical therapy, use of walking aids when necessary and appropriate, pharmacotherapy for spasticity in addition to physical therapy and exercise therapy, including range of motion and stretching, and consideration, when appropriate, of dalfampridine. Dalfampridine remains the first and only drug specifically approved by the FDA to address gait impairment in patients with multiple sclerosis. With dalfampridine, walking speed as tested by the 25-foot walk may improve by 20% or more, and in a number of studies, uh, a 20% improvement has been shown to be clinically meaningful. Importantly, the benefit seen with dalfampridine occurs not only in people with relapsing MS, but all, all forms of MS, including the progressive aspects of MS. Unfortunately, not all patients benefit from the treatment, and we have still been unable to identify predictive factors that permit us to identify those who will be responsive to the drug prior to trying it. In those patients who benefit from dalfampridine, they may see not only an observable improvement in their walking speed and walking quality, but also in their quality of life as impacted by their gait impairments related to MS. Of course, appropriate care must be taken in administering dalfampridine and any drug as indicated in the prescribing information. In particular, the concerns are avoiding people who have had previous seizures or significant renal impairment. Fortunately, I find, in my experience, it fairly straightforward to assess benefit versus risk using both objective assessments such as walking speed, but also carefully listening to the patient's um, individual experiences in terms of both any side effects, but also benefits that, that uh, they may have be, been experiencing in terms of their uh, walking-related impairment. And finally, um, in 2013, there have been uh, a number of patient-centric studies that have been published uh, demonstrating and, in effect, confirming what was seen in, in the Phase three clinical research studies, the value of treating people with dalfampridine in improving their uh, gait functionality and, and, in that, improving their gait-related quality of life. I thank you all for your interest in multiple sclerosis and for listening to our discussion of improving the management of gait-related problems in MS.